Thank you for joining us today for the second annual faculty lecture on spirituality for the MSU Folio Speaker Series on Spirituality. Initiated in honor of Father Jake Folio, an alumnus, former faculty member, longtime priest, and mentor to countless MSU student athletes and coaches, the MSU Folio Speaker Series on Spirituality offers the opportunity to explore the manifold meanings and applications of spirituality in the contemporary world through lectures, talks, workshops, and experiential events. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Additionally, I'd like to thank today's co-sponsors, the, the Center for Integrative Studies in the Arts and Humanities, the College of Arts and Letters, the Department of African American and African Studies, the Department of Religious Studies, and Peace and Justice Studies, all at Michigan State University. Each year, the speaker series includes an annual keynote, a yearly, uh, a yearly faculty lecture for which we gather today, as well as events and talks dedicated to highlighting the connection between spirituality, social justice, and diversity, equity, and inclusivity. This spring, on Tuesday, March 12th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. via Zoom, Professor Mark Umbright, professor and founder, founding director of the Center for Restorative Justice and Peacemaking at the University of Minnesota, will offer the third annual Spirituality and Justice Lecture. More information about this event and additional spring events will be announced in the early spring. In fact, you can find the uh, Zoom registration link on this cover uh, slide that we have right now. Established to advance Father Jake's commitment to compassion, justice, and our connection and responsibility to others, I cannot be more thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Professor Tamora Lomax. Dr. Tamora Lomax is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Michigan State University. She received her PhD in 2011 from Vanderbilt University in Religion, where she specialized in Black religion and Black culture, uh, Black culture studies. In 2018, Dr. Lomax published Jezebel Unhinged, Losing the Black Female Body in Religion and Culture with Duke University Press. In addition, she organized and guest edited Black Bodies in Ecstasy, Black Women, the Black Church, and the Politics of Pleasure, a special issue published of Black Theology and International Journal. In 2014, she published Womenist and Black Feminist Responses to Tyler Perry's Cultural Productions with Palgrave Macmillan, a co-authored edited volume with Ron S. Uh, Manigold, Manigold uh, Bryant and Carol B. Duncan. And she is currently at work on two book projects, Black Girls to Women, a Black Feminist Bible on Race, Gender, and Motherhood, and Black Boys to Men, a Black Feminist Bible on Liberating Motherhood, both be published with Duke University Press. However, Dr. Lomax isn't solely a teacher, writer, and researcher. She's a scholar activist. In 2017, she co-organized Our History, Our Future, a multi-generational human rights conference at Boston University, which brought together 1960s civil rights and Black Panther activists with Black Lives Matter activists. And in 2011, Dr. Lomax co-founded The Feminist Wire, an online publication committed to feminist, anti-racist, and anti-imperialist socio-political critique. Since its founding, The Feminist Wire has published close to 3,000 intersectional and justice-centered scholarly essays, including the original Black Lives Matter history by Alicia Garza in 2014, organized the very first university conference on Black Lives Matter at the University of Arizona, and coordinated various forums on topics such as Black academic women's health, Asada Shakur, Trayvon Martin, disabilities, and racism without, within feminism. In addition to online publishing, The Feminist Wire has a book series with the University of Arizona Press, The Feminist Wire Books, Connecting Feminisms, Race, and Social Justice. Earlier this year, The Feminist Wire, along with Dr. Lomax's papers, was purchased by Harvard University and is now The Feminist Wire Collection. A Q&A session for which I will act as moderator or follow the talk. Please feel free to use the Zoom features to post questions during or after the talk. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tamora Lomax. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I am really excited to be here and um, just happy to share some things that I've been working on and to really kind of work through them with you all because there's still a works um, in process. Yeah, so the title of my talk today <clears throat> is Building Sanctuary, Spirituality, Peacemaking, and the Black Church. I want to offer, I don't typically offer uh, trigger warnings in my talks, but I do want to do that today. Um, 
just, just as a courtesy. So I'm going to be talking about Black death, uh, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal violence, and also Black rage. Um, and so I will also have some images of that. So I just wanted to uh, let you know that. I want to begin with that this talk uh, was really inspired by my forthcoming book projects, Black Girls to Women, a Black Feminist Bible on Race. Get to that screen. All right. A Black Feminist Bible on Race, uh, Gender, and Motherhood. And then also uh, my second book, I'm writing them both at the same time, and they really kind of talk back to each other. And that is Black Boys to Men, a Black Feminist Bible on Liberating Motherhood. Now, both of these books are about being Black in America and having to navigate from one trauma to the next due to race, gender, and class, yet finding ways to survive anyhow. Um, this in mind, I often refer to the projects as Black protest books, uh, which in the process of writing became also critical discourses on Black sanctuary. Specifically, the text asks, what is sanctuary? for Black people in an America that is fundamentally anti-Black. Critical race theorist Derek Bell argues that anti-Black racism is foundational to America and thus American democracy because freedom and justice were imagined and institutionalized while America also owned slaves with no human rights. What I mean by that is that liberal democracy and racism are historically and, and inherently symbiotic because liberal democracy as we know it only exists because of its foundation in racially based slavery. Namely, it established the order in the new world and who would and who would not have rights and or be considered human, thus legalizing and justifying the black African slave market within a context of white supremacist capitalist patriarchal, patriarchal freedom. Now, Bell notes that liberal democracy continues to thrive because racial discrimination continues to thrive through two things, white racial preference and white racial bonding. To make it plain, anti-Black racism and racial violence continue as the American way, because one, the purpose of anti-Blackness is the maintenance of the slave market, as well as its ideologies and structures, but two, there are benefits in and a lack of consequences for maintaining the slave market's ideologies and structures. Thus, you may be thinking, well, slavery is over. Well, yes, the official apparatus of colonialism may have been removed, yet the ideological, political, economic, cultural, and social links established by the imperial project remain enabling systemic, structural, institutional, and interpersonal violences. This creates a context of unsafety, uh, of being without sanctuary for Black people. More, it constructs enhanced contexts of, of violence for Black cisgender, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, gender queer, bisexual, questioning, poor, disabled, grant, immigrant, and otherwise women and girls. So in thinking about myself as a black girl turned black woman turned black mother of black boys, now young men who came of age during the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, I began exploring possibilities for black sanctuary and black collective survival. <clears throat> oh, also just by the way, on the pictures, um, that's a picture of my mother my youngest sister and myself. It's not the cover of the book, but it is a picture that is within the book. And then on the second book, um, those are my sons. Uh, their faces are blurred out because it is America is not safe for Black people. And so I don't want to make them more vulnerable than they already are. Um, but this was during uh, tw the 2020, basically racial uh, and health explosion in America in marches. And so that was on top of a Confederate uh, monument. <clears throat> 
basically anti-blackness creates a particularly traumatic experience for black people. An inevitable effect um, is the ceaseless harvest of violence it produces on one hand and the spirits and souls it, it attempts to break on the other. My sons were 11 and nine, when 11 and nine years old, when 17 year old Trayvon Martin was murdered in Sanford, Florida for walking while wearing a hoodie. They were 11 and 10 years old when 17 year old Jordan Davis was murdered in Jacksonville, Florida for playing loud music in his car. They were 12 and 11 years old when 19 year old Renisha McBride was murdered in Dearborn Heights, Michigan for seeking help after a car accident. And they were 13 and 12 years old when 18 year old Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, uh, Missouri for jaywalking, but also not much long after 12 year old Tamir Rice was murdered in Cleveland, Ohio for playing in a park with a toy, with a toy gun. <clears throat> this section that I'm moving into Ferguson, because I want to pause there and then as a backdrop to talk about the Black church. Surviving America as a Black woman and a Black mother to sons requires early and consistent discourse on remaining alive. Despite structural oppressions, you still have to find ways to remain alive. But more than that, it's not just remaining alive. You have to become enraged about Black death. <clears throat> the thing about Black rage in North America, though, is that the colonial project and white supremacist capitalist patriarchal uh, power teaches us to discipline Black rage in ways that are useless and detrimental for our survival, meaning that Black rage, which comes from our most vulnerable places and deepest pains, is often trained to discharge on those that look like us rather than all that harms us. Um, in this picture, before move, moving on, you have pictures of the Black church uh, in the screenshot. Um, during slavery, um, you also see what causes Black rage, but also why they needed a very strong spirituality. And so you have this hanging and you have people around and there are smiles and there is just, you know, like it's just another part of the tree. Right. And then you have this image of a black folks in church. Um, and then you also have the Hush Harbor. Make a mental note of the Hush Harbor. The Hush Harbor is the secret places where the black people came together to create religious services, which later on became some aspect of the black church. Bracket that because I will return to it later. And then under that neat that and the black and white, you have um, Nat Turner, who was a, a preacher. Um, basically, his his uh, the rage that he organized and the insurrection he organized um, against against slaveocracy. In the essay "Eye to Eye: Black Women, Hatred and Anger" by Audre Lorde, written in 1984, she asserts that Black folks are taught to survive by metabolizing and neutralizing the knowledge of anti-Black hatred, hostility, and consent and contempt, which tutors us to not only dismiss ourselves and our feelings as suspect, but each other. More, the knowledge of anti-Blackness demands that we show restraint and tenderness to the rest of the world, but not ourselves or one another. Specifically, what I mean by that is that Black folks are consistently pressured to offer love, peace, forgiveness, in response to unremitting and unresolved an unarranged and unrepentant terrorism. There's always this image of, you know, something really black, something really bad happening to black communities, right? And the name of white supremacy, and then a camera shoved in their faces, you know, the people who have experienced this trauma saying, well, do you forgive them, right? I want us to really think about that and problematize that and, and how um, deeply anti-black and troubling um, and dehumanizing that is. I'll note this as an appeal to both 
um, Black folks, this historically, uh, this idea of having a higher moral code, but also what Derek Bell notes as white supremacist trickery. So I'm going to explain that. <clears throat> historically, uh, Black African slaves, particularly Black Christian slaves, took great pride in, in not mirroring the inhumane brutalities and brutishness of their masters. Albert J. Roberto, the author of Slave Religion, argues that North American Black African slaves developed a sense of moral superiority to their masters, which served to betray um, the slave's own self-esteem. However, over time, the slave became seen as the morally su superior suffering servant who forgives the master for the master's wrongdoing and prays for them, which is also deeply problematic. Now, while Black folks have their own reasons for doling out Christocentric notions of forgiveness, Bell would note that the demand, the white demand and or appeal to Black moral superiority and forgiveness without any kind of justice as a kind of white supremacist trickery, which notes Black rage as not only suspect, but criminal, right? So Black people, you don't have a right to rage for the things that you know, are the things that are happening to you structurally. This reading of disciplining of, of, of rage, Black rage is antithetical to Black survival and the building of Black sanctuary. However, Black Christianity and the historical Black church are still significant sites for reproducing and maintaining ideologies and cultures of restraint and forgiveness on one hand, but on the other hand, there's, there are also resources for historically cultivating Black rage that is useful. So they've done both. <clears throat> Six months after 17-year-old Jordan Davis's murder, the image of 18-year-old Michael, Brown Michael Brown's dead body spread out in the middle of Canfield Drive in Ferguson, Missouri, served as wallpaper in America's cultural backdrop, traumatizing Black folks, and particularly the people in Ferguson on repeat for four hours. Eyewitnesses report that Brown was fatally shot at least six times by Officer Darren Wilson as he tried to run away after being stopped for jaywalking. Wilson's grand jury testimony posited that Brown, known as a gentle giant to those who knew and loved him, Wilson said he looked like a demon. Now get this, gentle giant by the people who know him, a demon by the one who does not know him. As, Brown did, as Brown's dead body lied in the street, his mother, Le Leslie McSpadden, cried unconsolably while speaking uh, to local uh, television camera crews. She says, and I quote, you took my son away from me. You know how hard it is for me to get him to stay in school and graduate. Do you know how hard it is for many black men to graduate? Not many. Do you know how many graduate? Because of you, you bring them down to this type of level because they feel like they don't have much to live for. They are going to try to take me out anyway, she says, end quote. Weeks after uh, Michael Brown's murder, and that's Michael Brown in the center. <clears throat> Weeks after his murder, I attended the Black Life Matters ride in Ferguson, Missouri, at, uh, organized by Darnell Moore and Patrice Kahn Coolers, uh, founder of Black Lives Matter. That weekend is really the begin beginning of Black Lives Ma Matter as a social movement um, as we all came together in Ferguson. Um, approximately 300 Freedom Riders traveled to Ferguson to join lo local activists and organizers for strategic acts of opposition, community building, and support. As I was departing, I stopped my sons near the garage with tears filling my eyes. I told them, mommy may not make it back home, but whatever happens, I'm fighting for you. My sons stood silently and solemnly, and they hugged me around my neck. I'm still not sure if they fully processed what I was saying to them, um, that I could not make it back. 
Um, it took me a while to even process the trauma of that, sharing that with them, but also the trauma of knowing that there was a possibility that I could not make it back home. The weekend of political action in Ferguson was eye-opening, maddening, and life-changing. The people of Ferguson noted that the daily trek from their homes to the freeway, to work, to school, to the store, and otherwise, just doing regular things, was overdetermined by racial profiling and harassment by overzealous police officers. So literally, just imagine, every day, leaving their home, doing regular things, they are being harassed by police officers, which is why Michael Brown began to run from the police officer who shot him. So it is imperative to consider what it means then to be seen and treated as a demon and not a human every day, and especially as one who is locked out of the social, political, and economic economy. Uh, Ferguson is a very poor um, area, so it's not wealthy. So they're very much locked out. When, his, when, when Leslie was talking about her son and the ability to graduate and how hard it was, because he had just graduated, that's what she was talking about. Do you know what it means to put a Black boy who is already thinking of that the world is going to take him out? He's already thinking about death through school in an environment with severe social and political disinvestments, but then also racialized policing. <clears throat> the people of the city courageously raged against the power structure from the courthouse to the police station to count county prosecutors, uh, Robert McCullough's house and otherwise. There was no talk of piety and forgiveness, only no justice, no peace. Most of us will never know the emotional and psychic trauma of witnessing or really witnessing the dead body of a beloved community, especially a child. I don't care what his size is. He was a child. He was a teenager laying in the street for four hours. And initially, for most of that time, he was uncovered. To be clear, the scene of Brown's corpse serves as a 21st century lynching postcard. Notwithstanding the unrestrained rage of the poor and working class people of Ferguson delivered a new hopeful resistance. In between acts of resistance, pro protesters gathered at St. John's Church, a local black church, which not only found itself in the center of the budding Black Lives Matter social movement, um, but it also found itself housing us, feeding us, giving us a place to meet, a place to rest, a place to strategize, a place to cry, a, a place to blast off, dance, sing, comfort one another, cultivate sp spiritual renewal, and dream freedom dreams. What's fascinating to me is that at some point during our time there, which was several days, I'd forgotten that St. John was, was even a church not because it was serving uh, as a social political center for the nascent Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson. To be clear, the Black church has always understood racial segregation, discrimination, and violence as fundamentally at war with Christianity. No, I have forgotten that St. John's was a church because it seemed to be cultivating a kind of rage that was useful rather than demands for peace and absolution. In fact, it can be argued that St. John's, under the leadership of Reverend Starsky Wilson, noted Black rageful protests as a kind of mercy and peacemaking, particularly in light of what the alternatives could have been. And so I am working on Black Boys to Men, the book, at this time. And I begin pondering the following questions. What's useful and or harmful about the Black church sanctuary? How are, how are demands for love, peace, and forgiveness in the face of trauma, disciplinary, dehumanizing, and dismissive, and anti-Black? And how might Black rage be useful? And then finally, what kinds of sanctuaries do Black folks need to better survive? Oh, I should go back. I want to go back because I want to say a little bit about those uh, pictures.
Okay, so in the center, you have uh, Michael Brown's uh, corpse. Um, I'm gonna work clockwise. Um, in the red is his mother. Um, the people are surrounding his body. She cannot access him. Even though he is not living, she wants to get to her child. She cannot, I want you to think about the trauma, the psychic trauma of that for the entire community. Underneath is, her, is his mother. Below is his mother. This is during the funeral. She's bent over. Um, I'm gonna go to the top, actually not going counterclockwise. The top in the gray is his father. Look at the pain in his father's face, screaming out, right? Uh, beneath that is the church where we gathered. And then um, you see the protests and the church. Uh, we were working all together at the same time. Those are the protests uh, from, the, from our time there. I'm gonna say a bit about the black church, the back, a background about the black church. So I need to say up front that the black church isn't black because black people attend it or because black people found it. The historic black church born in North America on slave plantations by kidnapped, trafficked and tortured black African hostages came about in the encounter between the theft, trauma, terrorism and genocide of African persons. It also came about um, as they brought their plurality of African beliefs, faith, spirits, and the quest um, as well for white supremacy. So all of these things are from which are of a body from which the black church comes about dealing with white supremacy and empire, dealing with their plurality of religious beliefs, but also dealing with this terrorism, trafficking and genocide. The black church comes out of that and that's what makes it black. And though the black church not the black church, but the black African captives brought a plurality of spiritual beliefs and practices with them to North America, which they attempted to maintain. White slavers, missionaries, and ministers believe that Christianizing the black, the black hostage population would not only win an empire, but make better, more docile slaves who obeyed their masters, who accepted their station as slaves, and who provided um free physical and sexual labor for their lives and also the lifetime of their offspring. However, many uh, in the Black African traffic population rejected the white supremacy, supremacy of the slavers, missionaries, and ministers, and they created their own system of belief. So their religion was not, even though they were Christians, it was not the Christianity of their masters for the most part. Um, their religions was cross-pollinated with various variations of traditional African beliefs and practices such as conjure, hoodoo, and otherwise. Thus, while the Black church is irreducible to white supremacy and North American slavery, we cannot ignore the social, political, and racial context that produced its religious, spiritual, political, and cultural meaning. Ultimately, the Black church became a source for making sense of life here. It became a source for struggling against white supremacy and for making it so that physical slavery did not become mental or spiritual slavery. In this way, as James Baldwin posits in a conversation between him and Nikki Giovanni, the black African hostages that became Christians redeemed the profaned and idolatrous religion of the slavers. That religion was deployed to maintain their bondage and expand the slave market. The slaves religion that they redeemed was deployed for their freedom. And so the black African hostages embraced the liberating power of the Exodus story and the, and the story of Jesus's example, despite living in an absurd and terroristic world. And in this way, the religious gatherings that eventually became the black church served as a resource for imagining possibilities beyond present circumstances, for plotting resistance and for rejecting imperial ambition. To this end, the black church was humanizing. It allowed for a recentering of inherent dignity and self-worth, uh, self -worth, a remaking uh, of black culture and community. It allowed for access to literacy. It allowed for the conjuring of an alternative set of ethical codes for black survival. Its, its theology centered on a belief that Black Africans must be free. 
that God has an active role in history and on the side of the oppressed and that all is not settled. So despite what they were going through, all is not settled. There is a more. That said, the value of Black Christianity and the, and black, and the black sanctuaries it created isn't in how pious the slaves became or how closely uh, their belief systems mimic their captors or how vastly they enlarge the slave plantation. No, the value is in how their belief system affected their resistance, how it changed their response to their condition as slaves, how it led to practices of freedom, how it enabled agency in an otherwise absurd environment, how it produced an orientation for pursuing meaning, purpose, belongingness, and justice, how it proffered a sense of social responsibility, and how it created sanctuaries. Now, while the Black church practiced by Black African slaves represented a plurality of spiritual manifestations and theological profiles, a significant profile is its binding with the political quest for Black freedom, thus creating space for Black rage insofar as Black folks use their understanding of the faith for social political resistance. However, Black Christians in the Black church didn't always radically or adequately, adequately react to social realities. For example, some Black Christians emphasize piety, respectability, and otherworldliness uh, rewards, right, as a response to social issues, such as slavery and white supremacist violence and discrimination. Their response was more so not to, you know, push back. Our reward is in heaven. Some, some actually did uh, push forth that belief. <clears throat> Freedom and mobility uh, after the Civil War and Reconstruction created both promising opportunities and new challenges for survival for previously and newly free Black folks. For example, um, they got to choose whether to migrate North or West. They got to choose, you know, or experience um, all that comes with moving to urban series, uh, cities, and so they got to choose there. Uh, the re they had to reestablish kinships and communities Secularization became an interesting challenge, also a benefit. Um, the rise of Jim Crow and novel forms of white terrorism became a challenge. Um, they also faced poverty and joblessness, but there was religious pluralism. And in some cases, the Black church created space for radical resistance, right, to continue fighting against structural harms. But in other places, there was some emphasis uh, placed on, again, personal behaviors, a respectability, a rather than structural oppression. Now, I would argue that both streams of thought, those, the otherworldly respectability approach and the radical resistance approach, both of those approaches to the Black church can be found in its early beginnings on the slave plantations. You see both. You see those who, you know, uh, align themselves with their master's beliefs, um, and see themselves as wretched and Africa is bad and godless and um, um, serving, you know, demonic spirits and happy that, not happy to be slaves, but happy that they are Christians. And then you also see the radical resistance of the Nat Turner. <clears throat> Just one year after Martin Luther King's assassination, James Cone, the father of Black theology, writes the following um, in Black Theology and Black Power in 1969. Quote, it's a long quote. In slavery, one knows what the odds are and what is needed to destroy the power of the enemy. But in society, which pronounces a human free, but makes them behave as a slave, all of the strength and the willpower is sapped from the would-be rebel. The structures of evil are camouflaged, the enemy is elusive, and the victim is trained to accept the values of the oppressor. The black church thus lost its zeal for freedom in the midst of the new structures of white power. The rise of segregation and discrimination in the post-Civil War period softened its drive for equality. The passion for freedom was replaced with innocuous homilies against drinking, dancing, and smoking, and injustices in the present were minimized in favor of a kingdom beyond this world. Some Black ministers even urged Black people to adopt the morality of white society entirely suggesting that entrance into the kingdom of heaven is dependent on obedience to the laws of white society. This meant endurance now and liberty later, end quote. 
In 2010, Eddie Glaude published the essay, The Black Church is Dead in HuffPost. He posits the idea of this venerable institution as central to black life and as a repository for the social and moral conscience of the nation has all but disappeared due to conservatism, the politics of different needs and consciousness, and the root nation of the black prophetic witness. Now this root nation of the black prophetic witness that he's critiquing, it's really, a, he, it's a, it's, he's critiquing the idea that the prophetic energies of black churches are inherent to the institution. He's saying, no, they're not, past deeds are not evidence for the fact that the black church is inherently uh, prophetic, right? He's saying that, no, this needs to be rather um, consistently interrogated, right? So that is to say the prophetic witness and energies of the black church must not be taken for granted. They must be tested for the way, constantly tested for the ways that it radically stands in opposition to the slave market and the imperial project, but also in the ways that it insists on a revolution of values rooted in unequivocal and unapologetic collect collective emancipation and survival. Cohen asserts that in some cases, the black church became a devoted transmitter of white wishes and a monitor of obedience and a liaison between the white power structure and oppressed black people, thus serving a dual function of, of assuring uh, white people that all is well in the black community, right? Dampening the spirit of freedom, right? So all is well, don't worry about us, master. We're fine with how we're being oppressed. And so he's critiquing that. And he says, ultimately, this is dehumanizing. It's also the, the, the disciplinary work that the black church and others in society do and the demands for peace love and forgiveness in the face of trauma, which is in essence a request for black people to surrender to and accept the oppression of the imperial project. Now, while this is to be expected of the oppressor, it is antithetical to black radical resistance efforts, which the black church is a part. Still, the black church remains useful as a, galvani as a galvanizing site uh, where masses of Black people gather, where mutual bonds and trusts are built that can be leveraged for, for movement building and needs, and where spiritual resources in the face of hellish material conditions can be accessed. For many in the 1960s, uh, many of the 1960s uh, civil rights workers, for them, the Black church was an extended family, as well as a source of moral, spiritual, and intellectual formation. And for some, even today, it may be one of the initial vehicles for encounters with social protests and radical consciousness raising. In 2017, I co-organized uh, a conference titled Our History, Our Future, a Multi-Generational Human Rights Conference at Boston University, which brought together 1960s civil rights uh, movement leaders uh, in Black Panther Party activists and also um, Black Lives Matter activists. Um, ultimately for a two-part session, one is private healing uh, and then the other was public workshopping and conferencing. One day I'll, I'll write something about uh, the healing between um, generation generational movement leaders uh, and movement understandings of movement. Of, of social movement. Um, folks don't always get along and I, we don't know that, you know, in the public, but behind the scenes, folks don't always get along because a lot of times there are ideological and sometimes ethical um, differences. But anyways, I have the idea of bringing all these folks together and maybe um, we could begin some talks towards a reconciliation and better understanding. During the conference, civil rights activist Ruby Sales asserted, the Black church was the soul of the 1960s civil rights movement. It was what kept the movement going, what kept the movement workers both committed and sane, and what kept the Black church grounded. Now, I, I have thought a lot about that. Um, I remember in the moment, there was a lot of resistance from the Black Lives Matters activists because they felt like we don't need it to keep it sane. We're not like y'all, we're different. Um, hindsight is, is very interesting because I think that it was a they, they did need a spiritual center. And that's, that's a whole other talk, but we um, should be, what happened, right? They, I mean, there were a lot of issues, including ethical issues around finances, but the movement could not last. So there is a need 
for some sort of spiritual centering. And it doesn't have to be the black church, but historically it has been the black church. There's no other spiritual body that has centered itself in social movement in the way that the black church has, social political movement. Um, and so there, there is a need for some sort of uh, spiritual centering. And so despite, I would say, despite its challenges, the black church's challenges, um, it plays it played a similar role still, even though maybe not in the same way that it did in the 1960s, 60s, it still played a role um, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Christian ministers like uh, William Barber, Tracy Blackman, Michael McBride, who's on the flyer, uh, actually all the folks who are on this flyer, um, Reverend Starsky Wilson, uh, they represent what Martin Luther King Jr. once called a militant minority. And so the, that militant minority who's willing to utilize the Black church to take the social justice message forward. That said, the Black church remains pivotal to, even with my critiques, it remains pivotal to and therefore must be engaged when thinking about Black social movements for Black community and survival. The question is how? And I do say it must be engaged. It absolutely must be engaged because there is no body, no organizing body in the country that organizes as many uh, black folks together. So the black folks are still predominantly um, Christian. You need the black church in order to organize. <clears throat> I'm going to be closing out <clears throat> just a few final thoughts because I know that we're way over. Um, in my work, I propose reimagining sanctuary um, in light of the historical radical emancipatory profile of the black church, right? Not the respectability profile, but the emanc radical emancipatory profile. However, sanctuary, as I've begun to understand it, um, is not a place, but rather a philosophy and practice, each of which reimagines space. First of all, sanctuary is a direct confrontation with Black oppression and the status quo. It understands that there are no gains without demands, and it holds that there is no justice without peace. Second, uh, though it is oppositional, the work of sanctuary is not an ending white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, violence, and discrimination. That is emphatically not the work of the oppressed. Sanctuary aids the oppressed in standing together more forcefully against oppression, igniting the spirit of freedom to collectively resist despair, and in the words of June Jordan, to live hostile to hostility. Third, Sanctuary is about Black survival and thus refuses all forms of predation, whether inter intraracial and or communal. This in mind, a foundational politics of sanctuary for me is Black feminism, which demands that we resist oppression, oppression and dehumanization, right, right, white racism, heteropatriarchy, heterosexism, misogyny, homophobia, homophobia, transtagonism, classism, capitalism, ableism, plus all at the same time. Such work, such work demands the destruction of all systems of oppression while also participating in the practice of valuing ourselves and each other and creating the world that we deserve. To this end, sanctuary is world making and community building for fugitives. Aside from places of spirituality, worship and ritual, sanctuary historically offered protections for fugitives. And that protection could be ecclesial, political, communi communal or illegal. It was safe space as well as a place for plotting and negotiating freedom, thus creating safe space for Black folks to collectively live, love, rage, and conspire for freedom is the aim of sanctuary. The enslaved ancestors provide an example of the power of imagining sanctuaries outside of the master's gaze, theologies, and institutions. Um, oppositional sacred communions amongst them, um, they sprung up wherever they deemed or willed them to be. So my interpretation of sanctuary aligns with this practice. Um, in the same way, sanctuary serves as a critique of those sanctuaries that have failed to adequately respond to the ways that Black people in general, and Black women and girls, and particularly uh, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, gender queer folks, and poor folks and immigrants have been structurally, socially, and contemporarily endangered, right? So it is a critique of those sanctuaries that have not responded well. Ultimately, sanctuary says, that the, the emphasis on otherworldliness and personal behavior um, is not enough. We must center a race, we must center social justice for everyone. It is a rejection of uh, the it is a rejection of any kind of a predation, but it sees the sacredness, dignity, and worth of all black persons. It centers that. Um, it also notes that rage and hopefulness and interventions of the ancestors, it sees them as useful. Right? It interprets soul nurture as a moral duty. 
And ultimately, lastly, I'll say that sanctuary, it is an ethical awareness. It's the ethical awareness that the maintenance of a minoritized population is an expansion of a modern slave economy, right? Of which it is diametrically op opposed, right? So the practice of sanctuary is the resistance of the slave economy in any kind of way. And this, this is the work of peacemaking. We have to get to a place where there has been a radical opposition that has broken down like the structures of violence and then we can get to peacemaking. Anything before that, right, is, is, is actually just kind of doing fluff work. So, so sanctuary is in fact destructive of the slave market. <clears throat> Thank you.